Today's video is about a hugely popular wine. I'm going to cover all things Sauvignon Blanc. I'll discuss where it's grown, the various styles that can be found, what you can expect in your wine glass. I'm also going to have a tasting of four different wines that highlight the differences that can be found with this grape variety. And I also have some freshly harvested Sauvignon Blanc clusters. That'll be part of the conversation as well. It's really much more of a question of where is Sauvignon Blanc not grown? It's one of the world's most broadly planted wine grape varieties. I did a quick count on a world map. I stopped counting at 30 different countries. There was plenty more to go. Quick history on Sauvignon Blanc. It's not crystal clear, but most indicators do take it back to the Loire Valley in France. There it goes into some of the classic benchmark examples like Puy Fumé and Sancir. There you'll have versions that are 100% made from Sauvignon Blanc, and typically they will not have time in oak, or oak plays a very minor secondary role in most of those wines. If you go down to Bordeaux, it's a different story. There, Sauvignon Blanc is typically blended with other grape varieties, commonly Semillon. Many times the wines will spend some time in oak, especially if you're dealing with some of the more higher-end wines. But you'll find Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc partnered up in a number of wines there, like Entre du Mer, Graves, and Pessac Lignon. Also, on occasion, Sauvignon Blanc will play a complementary role in some sweet wines, like Sauterne and Barsac. There, typically, Semillon plays more of a front and center role, and Sauvignon Blanc more of a supporting element. As a side note, Sauvignon Blanc has a link to one of the world's best known red wine grape varieties. You have parent vines of Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc. They had a love child, and that love child is called Cabernet Sauvignon. All three of them are genetically very similar to one another. A common characteristic that you can find is something called methoxypyrazine, commonly just called pyrazine. But oftentimes it'll manifest itself in a bit of a capsicum or bell pepper character, which you can find across all three. While the historical origins for Sauvignon Blanc tie back to France, there's another country that's come on the scene that's very much redefined Sauvignon Blanc. And for many, it's really become the benchmark standard. And of course, I'm talking about New Zealand. If you're an old timer like me, and you can go back 25, 30 years ago and think of what was out in the wine trade at that time, New Zealand was barely a blip. I mean, there was virtually nothing out there from New Zealand except for a handful of properties. Now, New Zealand oftentimes is looked at as the benchmark standard for Sauvignon Blanc, specifically those wines from Marlborough. As for other countries that grow a fair amount of Sauvignon Blanc, there are many. Look in South America, Chile is a major player, a bit less so for Argentina. Some of the other European countries, like uh, Spain, for instance, has planted a fair amount of it in recent years. You'll find Wonderful plantings of it up in the northeast part of Italy, places in Austria. Several of the old uh, Eastern Bloc countries like Moldova grow a fair amount of Sauvignon Blanc. South Africa has some fantastic examples, one of which will be in the upcoming tasting. Australia is another place that's planting much more Sauvignon Blanc. And within the U.S., most of it is based either in California or in Washington State. In California, there's a labeling anomaly that's worth calling out. Occasionally, the wine will be called Fumé Blanc. It's a term that was coined by Robert Mondavi in the late 1960s. It's not a defined term, but back in the day, it loosely applied to Oak Age Sauvignon Blanc. Today, the term is still occasionally used, some of the wines being Oak Age, others not at all. The styles of Sauvignon Blanc can vary considerably, but oftentimes there is a common trait that can be found amongst many of them. They tend to be very aromatic highlighting primary fruit in many cases, uh, passion fruit, mango, guava, peach, kiwi, some citrus notes, all are very, very common. Uh, some herbal notes like dill and tarragon can often be found. Many of them will smell a bit like fresh mowed lawn. May sound odd, but actually is quite appealing. Alcohol levels are generally 13.5 or less. Acidity is high, which really highlights the freshness and brightness of the wines. Uh, very few will have oak influence, or if they do in some cases, but it's really more the exception than the rule. Oftentimes, you'll find the wines will be under screw cap, which I think is a wonderful thing for wines that are meant to be consumed very fresh and while they're youthful. 
And to that point, generally speaking, you're looking at Sauvignon Blancs that are not more than three years old. There's some exceptions to that, but oftentimes if you go beyond that age, the wine starts to lose some of its freshness. So the wineries and for the bean counters that are controlling the finances, oftentimes they love Sauvignon Blanc for a number of reasons. For one, it's a quick turnaround. You think of some wines, you have the fruit being harvested to the time that that finished wine is in your glass. In some cases, it can be years. With Sauvignon Blanc, it's a matter of months. Oftentimes, the production methods for Sauvignon Blanc are relatively inexpensive because of the absence of oak, which is a costly expense. The other is, with many grape varieties, as yields go up, oftentimes the quality will go down. Sauvignon Blanc has the ability to produce at fairly high yields and maintain good quality. YouTube has driven me to a life of crime. I stole some Sauvignon Blanc clusters from a Sonoma vineyard just prior to harvest in order to show them on this video. Three clusters weigh in at about one pound, four ounces, or around 600 grams. That would be enough juice for about one half of a standard bottle of wine. The fruit from this vineyard typically goes into Duckhorn North Coast Sauvignon Blanc. Over the years, I've had the chance to taste some wine grapes as they've been coming in at harvest. Many of the grapes do not taste anything like the finished wine, but there are two examples that clearly do. One is Moscato and the other being Sauvignon Blanc. The fruit has that zesty acidity and a lot of the aromatic and flavor compounds that you'll find in the finished wine, you'll actually find in the fruit itself. One characteristic that's quite common for Sauvignon Blanc is the appearance. Many will have a slight greenish tinge. Now on the palate, the wines just perk up your palate. They're fresh, they're bright, they're zesty. In many cases, the characteristics are quite overt. And I think this character in some cases leads to some haters. And the fact is Sauvignon Blanc is wildly popular. For me, I find that I'm drinking more of it, especially during the warmer summer months as I'm trying to eat some lighter foods. Also, the wines should be well chilled, and they're fantastic with a range of seafood and poultry dishes. If you have anything that has a cream sauce, the acidity in the Sauvignon Blanc will cut right through that and keep the palate fresh. First wine is a 2022 Yali Flying Swan Sauvignon Blanc from the Central Valley of Chile. Typically for these tastings, I'm using just a standard white wine glass, but today I'm using one that I picked up at Williams Sonoma. This is their Sauvignon Blanc glass, and I, I like the shape of this. this. This tight bowl is actually something that works great for very aromatic wines that are chilled. Uh, what it'll do is actually help the wine to stay colder for a long period of time versus a glass that had a lot of surface area. So I think this is gonna be a, a good option. Now, as for the wine, Good snap, that's always a good sign. This is a very much a entry level Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, a little embarrassed to say what I paid for this wine. It was under $5 a bottle. And this is entry level Sauvignon Blanc from Chile. This is a great way to start the tasting because this is really Sauvignon Blanc at its most stripped down basic level. The Central Valley in Chile is an area that is uh, it's really responsible for massive amounts of wine. Most of the fruit there is harvested mechanically and everything there is really built to a specific price point. The vintage is a 2022, so this is an extremely fresh version of Sauvignon Blanc. It does have a bit of that greenish tinge, but the aromatics, they're bright, they're fresh. There's a little bit of a grassy characteristic, which is actually typical of many Sauvignon Blanc from Chile. There's a specific clone that's grown there commonly for Sauvignon Blanc that brings out some of that character. But it really smells great. There's a vibrant, fresh character. For opening price point, who, who could have anything better than this? It's zesty, it's fresh, it's clean, very simple. It's all based on primary fruit. I'm sure this wine has come 100% out of stainless steel and it's just meant to be consumed very fresh and youthful. For a very cheap price, this is actually a, quite a solid bottle of wine. Next up is the 2020 Domaine Raffaut Sancerre. With the second wine, we're off to a classic region with Sancerre. In recent years, the popularity of this wine has taken off. Now, the one that I'm opening, this is a 2020 vintage. This is a very warm vintage for that part of the world. And as a result of that, the wines do have elevated alcohol. This one actually is up over 14%. That's not typical for Sancerre. With 21 vintages, you'll see those alcohol levels will be 
a half to a full degree less. Aromatics, uh, completely different than wine one, where wine one was just purely overt primary fruit. This has much more nuance to it. There's much more breadth, more length to it as well. Uh, aromatics, just uh, really beautiful. On the palate, again, it's, it's zesty, it's fresh, maybe a bit more weight, a little more alcohol than, than what would typically be found in these wines. But this is actually showing very well. The reason I'm showing a 2020 is it's actually what I had in my cellar. Uh, ideally, I would have shown a 21 vintage, but I had to work with what I had. The third wine up is the 2022 Cotsbrook Sauvignon Blanc from Marlboro. So while Sancerre is the classic from the old world, the next one is what has quickly become a classic from the new world. Uh, it's a producer called Cotsbrook. I've, I've not had this wine before. Under screw cap again, which I, I really love for these wines. Uh, this is from uh, the 2022 vintage. The alcohol level on this is 13%, which is what I'd expect for, for a wine like this. Uh, in terms of the color, and this is definitely has that green tinge to it. Very pale. Completely different aromatics than the first two wines. Well, the first one was very simple with that primary fruit. The next, a bit more restrained. Uh, this one is just overt. I mean, it is a fruit bomb. It has that passion fruit characteristic to it. It has a bit of that tarragon dill uh, aroma to it as well. And I love the way this smells. I mean, this, this seems like a wine that would be absolutely gulpable. Yeah, on the palate, really bright, uh, bright, fresh, clean, zesty, a lot of primary fruit to it. Good length as well. I mean, it's not a wine that just falls off on the back palate. This is solid made. This is a good example of, of Marlboro. Really do like this wine. I think I'll be drinking this a little later tonight. And the final wine is a 2022 Nieflingshof Sauvignon Blanc from Stellenbosch, South Africa. Before I open the last wine, just wanted to say if you have any comments on Sauvignon Blanc, I very much appreciate hearing from you. Maybe there's some producers that you're a big fan of. You've had some region that you just think is fantastic for Sauvignon Blanc please do post it down below. I try to follow up on each and every one. For me, one of the areas that's an absolute shocker for Sauvignon Blanc, and I think oftentimes overlooked, is South Africa. Uh, Stellenbosch is a place that I feel just produces amazing Sauvignon Blanc, and it does have some following in some places around the world, but to a large extent, I think these wines really do remain largely uh, undiscovered. Now, in terms of style, with the versions from South Africa, uh, specifically from Stellenbosch, to me, they strike some middle ground between what you'll find in uh, the classic area in Europe with Puy Fumé and Sancerre and those more overt styles that you'll find in New Zealand, in Marlborough, for instance. Yeah, the aromatics on the wine is just beautiful. There's something that's almost sublime about it. Uh, very elegant, refined style but it still does show a good amount of primary fruit. On the palate, there's great acidity. You can feel it right along the sides of your tongue. Uh, really bright, clean, fresh, elegant to no end. Uh, really an outstanding bottle of wine. South Africa is a place you need to explore. And I think at some point, maybe I need to do an entire video on what's happening down there because there's some of the most fantastic values that you'll find anywhere. Uh, this is a beauty. I thought I'd be drinking that New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, I think I may be drinking the South African instead. As always, thank you very much for your support of this channel. If you've not yet subscribed, do it right now. Hit that notification bell so you won't miss a thing. Hit that like button as well. It very much does help this channel. I hope you're drinking something fantastic tonight. I think I'll be doing okay. And until next time, I'll see you somewhere out in the wine world. Cheers.